Okay, so I will start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Ishita Muge. I um, have done a bachelor's in biology and psychology, and then just last year I completed my master's in neuroscience. Um, and I took this course when I was an undergrad, and then I've been lecturing in it uh, and kind of uh, being a part of it since then, since it's something that I really enjoy, and I feel like the course keeps evolving every time. So it's nice to see people taking the course again, too. So um, yeah, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, today, I will be talking about uh, the biotechnological revolution. Um, so this, I'll be going over some areas of biotechnology that are rapidly accelerating and that have some really exciting developments in the past few years. And I'll be talking mostly about them in regards to medical or environmental uh, applications and what kind of ethical discussions might have to take place as these technologies uh, become more common and more commercialized. So um, since I've been bumped up earlier this semester as well, um, I hope that some of these um, applications could also, and the discussions that we have along with them could also um, give you some inspiration for your final projects as well. So as I go through my slides, um, I'll have several slides of just kind of ethical questions. And I hope that we will be able to discuss these open-ended questions. So I'd love if you have any thoughts, you can unmute yourself and speak at any time. Or if you don't wanna do that, you can also uh, type any questions or share your thoughts in the chat and I can read those out as well. So yeah, please feel free to share your thoughts while I'm going through this. So as an overview, um, I have six main topics that I want to go over. Um, I, I won't read through them right now. So we'll start with biosensors. So a biosensor is an analytical device that's used for the detection of uh, chemical or physicochemical cues. So it, it interacts with or reacts to certain compounds and can alert us uh, that they're there. So many biosensors are common and have been used for years. Um, things like pacemakers to regulate your heartbeat. Um, but researchers are also trying to make smaller and more reliable biosensors for a greater variety of purposes. So some recent applications. Um, some of you might actually be using biosensors already. So if any of you have Fitbits or Apple Watches or any of those kind of things, um, you are essentially already using biosensors in daily life. So they're pretty basic in terms of what they sense, but they do uh, count as preliminary biosensors. So here are just some of the applications um, that are currently being developed. So uh, real-time monitoring of drugs, how they react to you personally. Um, they can measure pH, metabolites, and your temperature. Um, some really interesting things they can do is detect and read DNA mutations. So um, there are these little chips um, that can actually, sorry, that can actually be implanted and um, they can read these mutations in real time and transmit that data wirelessly to a mobile device. Um, and similarly, there's biosensors being developed that can uh, detect specific molecules that are associated with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cancers. Um, so my question is, would you uh, be okay with this kind of tiny little chip be, uh, being in, implanted in you if it was for these reasons? And you don't have to answer that right now. I'll, I'll give you another slide. Um, we can think about it and then we can kind of chat about the applications. So obviously for us, at this point, it, it might be kind of weird or like difficult to consider, you know, getting chipped or getting something implanted into your body. But it really, I think, would depend on what it was for, right? So if it was, what if it was for use um, with vulnerable populations? Like what if you or your family had a history of some kind of cancer or illness, um, would you then be willing to implant a chip in yourself so that you could have that early recognition system? 
Um, what if it was for patient compliance at home? So uh, what if there are elderly patients or uh, very young children who aren't actually able to take specific medication on time or do specific therapies? Um, would that be okay for you to ethically implant someone who um, can't necessarily give their own consent, but it's for their own good? Um, and there's other things as well, such as mood regulation. Like what if we're talking about basic things like a biosensor that texts you, um, you haven't had enough vitamin D today, you should go on a walk. Or your cortisol levels are super high today, maybe you should take some time to rest. Or for a diabetic person, your, um, uh, your glucose levels are dropping, maybe have a juice box or something. So does anyone have thoughts on this? Um, if you would, how you feel about these biosensor implants and if that's something that you would actually be willing to do or willing to see other people do. I will be willing to use them and to see other people using them. I think it's uh, um, like specifically for the last example you said, like diabetes, I think it's just a great thing because um, my grandmother had it and it used to be like a huge emergency when she's low, like she's over the limit so of sugar. So I think that's, that's great. That's just amazing to have that. Yeah, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Does anyone else agree or disagree with that? Are you maybe concerned about privacy or who's getting this kind of information? I think even I think that it is like good to have such things attached to your body, which can sense things and tell you. Especially like I, I myself as a, I'm a pre-diabetic, so there are certain things that that are attached to your arm, and then it lets you know about the your glucose level. So I think it is really important. Does anyone else have any thoughts to share before I move on? Yeah, I was going to say something, but I'm not sure if like it's extremely crowded around me, so I'm so sorry. No, we can go. Okay, I was just going to say that like um the, like it's it's pretty good as long as it's like reliable or like if it's like relevantly sensitive towards like the causes that we're using the biosensors. So as long as they're like reliably sensitive then sure but it's probably it may be disadvantages if, it, if they're not perfectly sensitive so they may like give us like wrong notifications maybe mm -hmm. so yeah and something else we'd have to consider is also are these permanent implants or I know there are some pacemakers that can stay in for like five to ten years but then you have to get a surgery to to get it replaced or get parts of it replaced so it's it's really there's a lot of considerations. So I think a lot of us would, sorry, I just, I, I just saw something in chat. Um, Kashika said that I would be willing to use them and would recommend others to do so as well because it's giving us live health updates. As the saying goes, precaution is better than the cure. Good to know it before if there are some symptoms or signs. So yeah, I think a lot of us agree that if it's for our health, it's, um, for it, it's used for preventing um, worse health problems from occurring, then in general, the consensus is probably, yeah, I don't mind getting these kind of implants. But um, I wanted to push it a bit further and ask how you would feel about non-medical uh, implanted devices. So things like uh, implants for phones and communication, for cameras and other enhancers. So these two are also being developed right now. Uh, things that, I, I think you've probably seen that example of people getting implants on their wrists or in their hands or something, which shows um, when there's a public Wi-Fi network <laughs> available around you. Um, things that might, even in the future, might help with communication. Um, like, you know, rather than an Apple Watch that's strapped onto you, an Apple Watch that's basically a part of you, right? That you can use for, messaging, for communicating with other people, so other people know your location, um, things like that. So would you be willing to do that for non-medical reasons? 
I, I see someone shaking their head. <laughs> Is that the overall consensus? That's a no. I mean, like, I can't really say that, like, no for sure, because, yeah, probably it's going to make everything so much easier. But without having an implement in our arms, we have zero privacy. <laughs> Imagine having it in our arms, like having like actually like living with them. So I think it's just like, like negative infinity privacy. <laughs> okay, so further question. What if all of your friends had it? <laughs> What if all this, yeah, go ahead. I think what it's gonna happen in the future, right? I was, I was, uh, I was just seeing this thing. Um, I don't even know where was I, but like um, I was seeing this, like the the future of the internet. That's not gonna be just like a. Uh, it's we're gonna have like a three D internet in future that like we can just like sit down and like attend a concert with our friends without even without like moving from our bed. And it sounds exciting and it sounds interesting and I think like everybody is gonna like. Uh, everybody's gonna use it when it's trending right but then like when it's not there yet and you can just read the theory and just think about it honestly like technology kind of scares me sometimes I'm like oh my god what a world are we like <laughs> moving towards but I think like it's like it's gonna be like super super convenient if like everybody has it but like if all of my friends have it then other people are gonna have it too so again like there are some people that I don't know there are some people that I don't want to don't want them to know a lot about me but they're gonna end up knowing a lot about me so that's a little scary I don't know <laughs> yeah a lot of people have these like privacy and security concerns and I agree I think it's it's natural to be worried about that but then I also consider the fact that I, I think about this privacy and security, but at the same time, I have my phone on me, like at all times. Um, I, I don't have an Apple Watch, but if I could, like if I, if I had one, I'd wear it all the time. And that also transmits lots of data, like my location, like my heart rate, a lot of things. Um, so it kind of makes me question that if I'm just, if I just have these reservations because it's not really available to me yet, but if it was something that was commercially available and like lots, everyone else had it, then it, it's possible that I might just get it and not have these uh, reservations actually stopping me from doing that. Um, and I also see another comment. It also depends on the hackability of it in the sense of what companies are creating it and what assurance the public has that the info can't get hacked by a third party. So, yeah, I actually, I, I don't know a lot about um, kind of cybersecurity, but I do know that most, the the public consensus right now seems to be that um, we don't really love how much our uh, phones are, you know, listening to us, how much our um, activity is being monitored. So I would assume that going forward, these kind of concerns would only be amplified. So does anyone else have um, any thoughts about this at all? I guess like some similar stuff to what Pri and Mizba said, I feel like the legal side of things isn't keeping up with the mm -hmm. pace that technology is, is progressing. Like we kind of saw it with the whole like Facebook information leak and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and even just like the information, like the questions that um, like Zuckerberg and stuff was, was being asked during uh, like the trials over it and stuff it was clear that a lot of people on the legal side of things don't necessarily have like up-to-date information about how fast technology is progressing and so like every time there's an information leak I feel like we keep seeing that like like laws are being made after things already happen and so I, I think that would continue to be a concern with with new technology and privacy and stuff like that it would have to be out for a little while before there's there's laws put into place and I think until there's a sort of switch there like legally things are happening before technology is coming out. I don't think that privacy concerns are really going to be addressed in a super timely manner. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have uh, anything to add to that?
Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll share my thoughts. I, I completely agree with what you said. I think um, it's, it's actually kind of shocking to see the kinds of uh, questions that, um, you know, the lawmakers ask of like, you know, Zuckerberg or, or these kind of people. It's, it's shocking how little they know about the laws that they're making. Like, so it's, I think for me, the only way I see this um, moving forward in a positive way is actually getting people with the technology background, with like the security background into those places where they can actually help shape those regulations. But um, obviously I, th I think it'll be a while before something that progressive <laughs> starts to happen. Um, so I'll be moving on from the biosensors topic. Does anyone else have anything to add before I do that? Okay, so I will go to my next um, topic here, which is bioprinting. Um, so I'm sure Dr. Solis has talked a bit about regenerative medicine. So essentially bioprinting is um, utilizing 3D printing te techniques to combine cells, growth factors, and biomaterials to um, fabricate biomedical parts. So this is often done with the aim of imitating natural uh, tissue characteristics uh, to be used for regenerative medicine. So I'll, I'll quickly uh, go over the process, but it's not something that we'll go into much detail about right now. But essentially um, the cell sample is obtained from a healthy human participant or a cell bank. Um, and this ink, is made by uh, combining cell cultures with biomaterials. So the cells are kind of embanded with the biomaterials and it creates this uh, 3D printing ink, but it's essentially a, a 3D structure. And the cell viability rate um, for companies doing this so far has been over 95%. So it's quite successful so far. Uh, after that, the 3D structure is printed layer by, by layer, very similar to a 3D printer. And um, this is a quote that I have off of the website of one of these companies um, saying that artificial human tissue um, is created with the same composition, architecture, and functionality of the real human one. So I, I included this quote because it's uh, very ambitious. <laughs> it's very optimistic. And it's, it is the end goal, but I do, uh, I am a bit skeptical that this is something that's being achieved right now, that the artificial human tissue is the exact same functionality, everything wise as uh, real human tissue. But I do think that the technology is um, improving really rapidly. So um, I do feel like this may be possible in the future. So, Obviously, as with everything, there are ethical considerations. So concerns of stem cell source. Um, so embryonic stem cells um, have been met with lots of moral and ethical concerns, as you can imagine. Um, but at the same time, induced pluripotent stem cells, which are uh, created using uh, adult uh, fully differentiated cells, um, they have a great risk of mutations since the time between extraction of those cells and transplantation is very long. So there's a higher risk of tumor, tumorigenicity, um, and that's one of the major problems there. And then also, I think this no legislation thing applies to basically all of the rapidly improving technologies I'm going to talk about today, in that it the legislation is just not... Um, catching up with the uh, with how rapidly the technology is evolving. So, so far there's no legislation um, regarding the ownership, processing, and storage of genetic information. And obviously this is very valuable information. Um, it's private and at, I, I think that along with the uh, medical technologies that are improving, um, it also increases the risk of having all of your genetic information just publicly available. And then uh, there's also the question of who is in charge of digitizing anatomy. Is it uh, doctors and physicians? 
Is it biologists, engineers, computer scientists? Because these are all people um, that need to be involved in uh, bioprinting human tissues and human organs. And finally, uh, the social stratification of organ printing. Um, obviously, if these kind of technologies evolve to the point where we're able to uh, 3D print uh, organs for transplantation, it's going to be the, um, the rich people, the people in Western countries who have access to this, um, and that still leaves a large population of the world that's unable to, um, in many cases, unable to survive because they don't have access to um, the organ transplants that they need. So, oh, that was my last slide there. I just wanted to ask, does anyone have questions about this or any other um, ethical considerations or, or any comments at all? Okay, I will move on to the next one. Um, I know I'm going through these pretty fast, but um, I, I just kind of wanted to provide like a, an overall glance of several different um, aspects of biotech. Okay, so my third topic is tissue engineering. So we'll be talking about the process of using viable cells, um, bioreactors and scaffolding to create tissues, muscles, uh, organs and joints. So before I go into this, I kind of wanted to talk about the meat cultivation industry today. So the meat and dairy industry um, have a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So they create um, 7.1 gigatons of greenhouse gases annually, and that's 15% of total man-made emissions. So it is quite a significant um, uh, amount. And to illustrate, um, one kilogram of wheat produces two and a half kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions, while one kilogram of beef produces 70 kilograms of emissions. So it's, it's quite a significant, uh, it's quite a significant portion. So in terms of meat cultivation, there are lots of uh, cell types that can be used as a starting inputs for meat production, um, but more research is required to determine which cell lines are best suited for large scale manufacturing of um, these, uh, these like beyond meat type uh, commercial businesses. So the process for meat cultivation is um, the initial cell sample is collected from a healthy animal and stored in a cell bank. So very similar to the human bioprinting, except this one isn't uh, using 3D printing. Uh, this one instead uses a bioreactor or a tissue cultivator, um, which uh, imitates the internal uh, conditions of a of an animal. So it, it includes it imitates the internal temperature, um, the different solutes like sugars, fats, nutrients, amino acids, and growth factors, um, and Essentially, this bioreactor is used uh, with plant-based scaffolding to create, uh, to give that tissue something to grow on. And that's essentially how um, fake meat tissue is created. And then of course, it's ready for harvest. <laughs> so some ethical considerations here are uh, private versus public cell line repositories. So this again goes back to that social stratification. Um, there are intrinsic cell characteristics like suitability for uh, suspension growth, um, not, not in vitro growth, uh, doubling times or growth rates, um, different metabolism, uh, differentiation capacity and things like that, that can vary from cell type and species. So a lot of companies that are cultivating meat this way um, are, are trademarking and privatizing their technology and the cell lines that they use, which is creating a bigger barrier of entry for other people to uh, join that industry. 
So this is again something that might actually slow down the development and um, drive up prices. Another question is, are traditional meat suppliers punished? So uh, there are a lot of people in the world that actually depend on uh, cultivating meat, on um, farming to support their ways of life. So if uh, meat cultivation uh, in this way, in this sense, is actually uh, the way that we're moving in, in the future, which I think would actually be beneficial for the environment, um, would traditional meat cultivators, I mean, it, it's just a question about how they would, uh, what kind of structure would be in place to support them. Um, are cultivated organs or cloned animals given the same moral status as normal ones? So of course there are uh, laws and regulations dictating how humanely animals should be treated. So does this apply to animals that have been specifically cloned or grown um, for this reason? And yeah, that's the last question I had on there. So does anyone have any thoughts about this? Are these animals protected under the same laws? How do we even keep track of them if this is something that's happening um, you know, behind closed doors? There's not very many regulations on this. Okay, I will, I'll keep going. But I think um, keep, keep some of these questions in mind because the next topic, gene editing, I'll be talking about um, a lot of these same ideas, but in regards to humans. So um, yeah, just you can kind of think this over and then see how it applies for uh, human babies as well. Um, there's a comment from Mispa saying, I think as long as the clone animal by definition has life, it should have the same laws governing and protecting them. And I think, I think a lot of people would agree with this, but um, in terms of meat production and the actual businesses that are doing it, I think a lot of them would disagree because the whole point of uh, the whole reason why they're putting in this effort and creating uh, cultivating meat this way is to avoid those regulations. So that is something to consider. Um, a lot of the time, money is king in terms of creating these regulations. Okay, so gene editing. Um, this topic is um, controversial and I think it's, it's really fun to talk about. Um, since there's so many different ways you can approach it and there's so many, I, I feel like a lot of people's moral and ethical uh, lines can vary based on who we're talking about, wh whether it's animals or whether it's humans. So um, yeah, just, just keep that in mind. So gene editing is um, when DNA is inserted, deleted, modified or replaced in the genome of a living organism um, in a specific location. So many of you have probably heard about the CRISPR-Cas9 system. It's one of the more popular gene editing platforms. I won't go into uh, too much detail about this, but essentially all you need to know for this is that the system in induces DNA breaks in certain uh, specified locations and it reinserts the desired code into that break. So basically what you can see in this little animation over here, um, it targets a specific spot and you can essentially rewrite um, the genomic data that's there. And um, a, a commercial example of using gene editing is in plant products. Since we tend to think of gene editing as kind of a more far away thing, I think that a lot of us don't realize that a lot of the 
things that we're already eating, a lot of the vegetables we're already eating have been uh, genetically edited. So lots of food companies uh, mutate uh, specific genes to create um, basically anything they want, but usually it's to create higher, uh, for example, to create higher concentrations of specific oils to lengthen the shelf life of certain food items, for example. So a more high profile uh, gene editing case that you may have heard of um, is uh, this case from um, China um, in which these two babies called Lulu and Nana, um, and those are aliases of course, uh, were genetically edited. So in this case, um, there were couples who were trying to have children. Um, the men in, in the study had HIV and the women did not. And they were trying to have kids who also did not have HIV, of course. So uh, the researcher in this case muta mutated the CCR5 gene, which is the specific gene that um, is, uh, can be found uh, naturally mutated in some people that make them resistant to HIV. And they modified that so that the children would also be resistant to HIV. So this is a mutation that does occur naturally in some people, but in this case, they specifically induced it in these embryos. So unfortunately, um, they found some mosaicism in these embryos in that some cells had the mutation and some didn't. So um, it's unclear whether it was successful. And then finally, when this case came to light, um, it was originally praised, but later came under big, big scrutiny as it became more widely publicized. So um, there were a lot of difficult kind of issues with this because the researcher here um, was also found to have forged some review papers to push forward the experiments. Um, so it was, it's not entirely certain if the parents knew exactly what they were doing or if they were misled in some way. Um, and essentially it ended up with uh, this researcher uh, being charged uh, a monetary fine and then also three years in prison. He still defends his research, uh, but pled guilty. So of course, <laughs> This leads to a whole host of ethical problems and considerations. There aren't currently any universal laws about gene editing embryos. Um, usually when embryos are gene edited, they aren't allowed to grow past 14 days. So they're supposed to be um, basically terminated after 14 days. Um, but in this case, they were implanted um, back into the mother and um, allowed to come to term. So there's also no restrictions about selling embryos. Even if it isn't allowed in one place, like let, even if it isn't allowed in Canada or America, why, why not just take a flight to somewhere else um, to, to do it? So really, it, it, I feel like for these kind of things, unless there are more universal laws, there's really no point to like smaller regional laws because it's so easy to just go somewhere else and gene edit your babies if that's really what you want to do. So there's lack of legislation. And then there's also a question about why is selling most body parts illegal, but not eggs? And then what are the consequences for breaking these laws? Um, the researcher in this case was punished, um, but what about the parents? Um, even though they seem to have been misled. There are also other reports saying they knew exactly what they were doing. They signed the consent forms, so they obviously knew that they were signing up for uh, gene editing being done on their embryos. Um, and what about the babies? The, the gene edited babies, um, we really haven't heard much about them, which is probably good. They're not being, um, you know, poked and prodded at, but at the same time, uh, I think the science community in general would be interested in seeing what actually happens 
when genetically edited embryos grow up. So uh, yeah, what are your thoughts about this? Like you said, such things like gene editing should should have a universal law, law uh, rather than a regional law, because such things are really uh, important. Because some people like gene editing and all, what happened to those babies? Like, if we see it emotionally, it's good because the parents had HIV, so the, they tried uh, they tried so that the child didn't have HIV. So it's in a way good for the they thought good about the child. But uh, it should be in such condition that such facility should be not only to people who have money, but also to all the people in the world, irrespective of where they stay or irrespective of the country they are in. So if such thing is like universal, then it's okay because it if it if it is done for the good of good for somebody, then it, then it's okay. Otherwise, if it is done just because some people have money and like that, then it, it should not be done. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Do you agree with Puja? I was, I was I was just going to say that I understand why it's not universal just yet, just because probably there's not enough like research um, um, yet. And like, I think I think we can probably just like talk about like how some people were against Pfizer just because it's like an RNA vaccine and like it wasn't, it's pretty new, people are against it because we didn't have enough research on it. And I think gene editing is, it's, it can be pretty huge. It's a lot huger than just like a vaccine for a virus. And I think before, uh, before um, making it global, I think there should be enough research so they can back it up because there's going to be people like against it for sure. And you can take, like, it really depends on how you're taking advantage of it. I, I'm a bioinformatics student and I, and I was a summer student um, last summer. And then I remember like the prof that I was working with, uh, she was telling me that when it comes to science and when it comes to genetics, you can decide whether to make drugs or to make vaccines. So like, it really depends on like how you're taking advantage of um, the science that you have or the technically like everything that's provided for you. And I think I'm very much with gene editing as long as you're using it towards making a good change. But at the same time, it can be extremely scary because you can do horrible, horrible things with it. Um, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have anything to add to that? Um, I think just really quickly, like on this, it kind of is something that has like two sides to it because of just also like the money factor that goes into like creating something like this, like it would be hard not to create like a completely separate almost class of people who have like mm -hmm. access to having like genetically modified children versus like people in very rural or like poor areas would not have like access to this type of like, let alone like medical facility, but also like just the money to fund this. Um, and then on the other side, I kind of also see where it could be like somewhat ethical because people already are having children through like, I guess, unnatural in the means of like people get surgeries to like have a better chance of having children or like they get like basically like externally like in petri dishes they can like put embryos like together and then put them back in the mother and so like people are already kind of having ways of like basically trying to have children without it so I could see that it could also become like ethical if we're already kind of manipulating some stuff. But yeah. So I, I find this really interesting because um, I we also had a discussion about this uh, in, in last semester's class and a lot of people were against gene editing babies um, because, you know, it's, it's scary. You don't exactly know um, if the changes you're causing are actually the changes that are occurring. There could be off-target mu mutations mosaicism, things like that. Um, and interestingly, a lot of the, um, the kind of opinions on the internet about this, about this specific case, a lot of people were also saying that this is kind of what science needs. Um, there are some times when there just needs to be a big push, even if it's not entirely legal to, to kind of break through uh, 
this like barrier that we've had where we're not gene editing on humans, but now that someone's done it, we can start thinking about the future and start um, thinking about these advancements and how they can actually be applied. So it's really interesting seeing uh, how many different points of view there are on this. Is anyone here kind of uh, not convinced that this is something that we're ready for yet? I honestly don't think it's like, it really depends on like individuals. <laughs> I think like bigger people are deciding. <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm against it at all. Like I really love it. It's 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 a pretty interesting topic. And I'm, I'm really excited to see like what comes next, especially as like a bioinformatic student, I think. Uh, but then at the same time, I don't think like we can, as individuals, we can really decide on what's coming next. Yeah, we should all just be ready for bombing technology, uh, which could be pretty scary. And it could also like if, if we're taking like correct issues of it, it can also be pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, in terms of I, I think what Puja was saying earlier too that it, these kind of technologies are can be good but only if there's equal opportunity for everyone. Um, I, I would of course agree with that, but I think it's inevitable that that's not going to be the case, at least right at the start. Um, even with vaccines, um, there were countries that got vaccines before other countries. There were people that got vaccines before other people. So I think um, in these kind of cases, uh, especially because um, I think these kind of technologies will also have a very high cost of entry. Um, it seems very likely that uh, the more privileged you are, the more access you ha will have to it. And again, this goes back to what we were talking about with biosensors, that everyone mostly agrees that it's good when it's medically important. Like if it's stopping your kid from being born with HIV or, or something like that. Um, but when we start talking about gene editing, it, it's really a slippery slope of if I can stop my kid from getting HIV, maybe I also want to make them resistant to lots of other things. Um, maybe since we're doing that anyways, I also want them to be uh, six feet tall and athletic, and I want them to have this hair color, and I want them to have this IQ. So it it starts getting scary. And I think it does open up the possibility for that kind of world where it's like you're um, the rich uh, edited people who are just like, you know, the ideal people. And then it's like the, you know, poor normal people who, who can't live up to that standard, you know? So that's, that's another fear that I think people have. And although it sounds like a very exaggerated thing, it sounds like something from a sci-fi book, I think it is a valid fear, especially now that um, researchers like the, like the one we talked about are feeling um, emboldened enough to take these kind of steps um, without any, like illegally, right? Without any um, permission from, from any, any government or any uh, ethical institute. Um, so yeah, does anyone have anything to add to that? Um, in the chat, Amir said, I think it's a matter of too much or too little. We consider things done in moderation to be perfect. Perhaps the real problem is concluding as a whole what moderation needs to be. I think that's really interesting. Sorry, do you mind expanding on that a bit? <laughs> yeah, like, uh, uh, hi, Shadada, good to see you, hi. hi. Uh, <laughs> I think like in general, like when we think about even things like exercise, right? Like. Like when you talk to people, like you wouldn't, you'd say like, oh, we have a perfect amount of exercise. You do too much and bad things happen. You do too little and bad things happen. And I think that's with like any notion. So I think like when you consider something like, I don't know, like, uh, what were we just talking about? Uh, gene editing, right? Like take things too far and obviously problems are gonna arise, but it's obviously 
can be good. So it it would not pay off to not do it at all. So it it I I say things I like to say things better in writing. So I can't, <laughs> but. no, I think that was that was helpful. It it kind of expanded your point more. I think that's true. Like a lot of um, a lot of the reasons these ethical questions arise is because uh, we we think about the people that will you know take things to excess, take things to the point where they probably shouldn't go. So uh, yeah, I think a lot of this is also again it goes back to the legislation of it. It goes back to you know making the rules and having them actually. Um, be ahead of the technology rather than lagging behind as they are right now. And um, going to the, the third point here, consequences, that's another issue that I think legislation is having, even when it is caught up to the technology, um, they don't really know what to do. Because even if we're talking about Facebook, it's like, if, if there's a data leak, who are you, who are you going to punish? Um, is it going to be the, the main CEO guy of the entire company? Um, is it you know, the people who made the internal laws for it, uh, the people who are in charge of security, like there's, there's so many, these kind of technologies aren't dependent on one person, right? There's, it's not one person's responsibility. So it's difficult to figure out um, in this gene editing case, are the parents liable for if there's anything wrong with, uh, with the gene editing that they allowed to happen to their babies? Like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, does anyone else have anything else to add before I move on? Okay. All right, I will move on to the next uh, topic. Biomanufacturing. Uh, so this is a bit less controversial. To, to give us a little break from uh, thinking so much. <laughs> um, but essentially, um, I wanted to briefly mention some of the applications of biomanufacturing that have the potential to um, drastically help the environment. So biomanufacturing utilizes uh, biological systems for the production of medical products and therapies, um, food and beverages, uh, biomaterials and chemicals. So there are several startups that are advancing different cell cultures and fermentation um, and recombinant production technologies to make biomanufacturing inexpensive and um, scalable. So one of the applications I wanted to talk about is protein production. So um, there are these there are companies using data and AI to make protein designs and using flies basically as soft bioreactors. So earlier I mentioned that a bioreactor um, is essentially a uh, is essentially a container, a, a thing that you can use um, to build uh, specific cells or tissue in. So this company in specifically is using uh, black fly larvae and using CRISPR to transform the larvae to continuously produce um, the protein of interest. So um, they could be used to create vectors for vaccines, um, antibodies, things like that. So this is actually something that could help a lot rather than using uh, the single use uh, plastics that a lot of companies are using for these bioreactors by using biological bioreactors that exist in nature. Um, the other example I wanted to give, um, which is completely different, is um, in gas fermentation. So there are carbon recycling uh, companies that are using microbes to convert carbon dioxide from industrial emissions into high value products. So obviously we know that uh, farming um, and spe specifically cows and other, um, what is it called? The uh, cows and pigs and basically that, that class of animals that we cultivate um, emit a lot of greenhouse gas, specifically methane. So um, 
there are these companies that use gas fermentation to convert CO2 and other gases into biomaterial. And then they use that biomaterial um, back to feed the animals themselves. So it creates this animal feed. Um, and I think I have it written here. Oh, the, their specific name is called Proton. And it's a high value uh, protein ingredient that's optimized for use in animal food. And it's significantly more sustainable um, than uh, using regular feed. So yeah, these are just two applications that um, have significant impacts in how, uh, in how they can help uh, change the environmental impacts of those industries. So finally, I wanted to talk about neurotech. Um, this is something that I'm most familiar with um, since it's basically what I've done my research in. Um, and I just wanted to touch on a couple applications that have the potential to and are currently improving the quality of life for a lot of people. So brain computer interface, which uh, is becoming more and more utilized uh, now, is um, essentially an EEG cap for recording neural electrical activity. So it's non-invasive, it's just something that you fit over your head. Um, and this uh, tracks your brain activity and it processes it, processes it to interpret your desired action. So this is being used um, for a lot of people with uh, things like uh, having a bionic arm or being able to control a wheelchair or um, there's, there's lots of things that they're using it for, like being able to turn on uh, room, turn on lights in specific rooms as you move through them. So there's, there's an endless uh, list of things that this can be applied to, even things like video games and stuff. So the signal is sent to carry out your desired action and feedback is provided to the user to aid in learning and adaptation. And by that, I, I usually mean there's um, often some kind of physical feedback to help your brain develop those connections. Um, and this is useful for assisting anyone with any kind of functional limitations, um, even for communicating, um, pain management and things like that. And then finally, I wanted to talk about virtual and augmented reality. So um, this animation is uh, from my master's project. Um, we would kind of have kids sit in this robot exoskeleton. This of course is an animated child, but uh, this is uh, how, it's a representation of how they're moving. Um, and they were put into this virtual reality uh, environment and told to do different tasks. So this is one of them, object hit and avoid, where there are certain shapes that they have to hit away from them and then certain ones that they have to dodge. And uh, this kind of helped us learn how kids uh, with different neurodegenerative disorders, sorry, neurodevelopmental disorders uh, make decisions, um, how their executive function is compared to other kids. So this is just one example of using virtual or augmented reality, but it's also being used for a lot of other things like um, anxiety, uh, physical therapy, uh, managing chronic pain. So um, my project was an example of uh, using games to understand movement and decision making, but this can also be used with uh, professionals like um, for training and surgical planning, um, as well as lots of different things. I recently saw a news story about a farmer that fitted his cows with um, AR goggles to make it seem like they were in like uh, pastures, like in a nice field. And that actually improved their milk production because they were happier. So um, it's really interesting um, the kind of applications that these can have, not just for um, patients, but it can also be used for so many different things. Um, so I think that was my last application slide. 
but uh, the last thing I wanted to address um, before I, I open the floor to any kind of comments and questions is this kind of conceptual shift of medicine. And I think this is, this encapsulates a lot about what we talk about in this course, that medicine might not necessarily always fit within that framework that, it's, that it has been traditionally, where a, a patient has a problem, they come to the doctor, you treat the patient, and then the goal is that they're no longer a patient. Um, and that's how it's been. But I think with a lot of these technological advancements, we are kind of moving into this, the patient is, is overall fine, but they could be better. <laughs> so they come to the doctor not to treat something, but to enhance themselves and then they get to leave as that um, new and improved version of themselves, not necessarily bringing them back to baseline, but actually pushing them further and seeing how technology can actually um, kind of improve the human condition past what it's been so far. So um, that wraps up uh, everything I wanted to talk about. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or comments, um, I would love to chat with you. So if you have any, any kind of uh, issues with, with all the ethical questions I gave you today, um, if you have any comments or any questions about specific things that I talked about, you can feel free to ask. Yeah, we have uh, 24 minutes. <laughs> so we can have rich discussion here. No, I think that this is, been an, uh, an outstanding uh, presentation of, of, of many very interesting areas. And it, it's kind of exactly the mainstream of what the course is, uh, is about. Yeah. So questions, comments? Um, I liked what you were saying about uh, the sort of switch over to more enhancement instead of just um, like patients coming in for, for improvement and stuff all the time. Um, and it kind of linked back to what you're saying about biosensors, because I heard that the like newest Apple Watch has some detection of some like heart ir rhythm irregularities. Um, and I'd heard like a story where someone actually like got a notification on their watch that there was some sort of abnormality in, in their heart rhythm and they went to the hospital before they had any symptoms or anything. Um, and they did actually like hook him up and found that he he had like kind of low level AFib and he got treated for it like before he even had any symptoms. So it's kind of like one example of taking those steps in, in that direction using like biosensors and stuff, which was kind of neat. Mm -hmm. I think that's so cool. I think like a lot of the examples I, were, I was giving were that like if you have some kind of uh, issue if you have some kind of disease then you might want to get it to help help treat it but you're right like even if I didn't if if I had a sensor that could kind of just be checking consistently that everything's fine I would probably want that because I'd want to know you know before anything happened if if I was going towards something uh, happening with my health so that that's a really cool example Anyone else have any thoughts or comments? Um, it just, I'll, I'll add something. Um, along with the cow thing that I mentioned with the, the cows with the AR goggles, um, I also saw these tests about using those goggles on uh, like house pets, on dogs. Uh, with anxiety issues, like when they're being left alone at home, um, and kind of giving them these goggles to feel like, uh, to help relax them. Um, I don't think they can make it feel like you're with them because that seems very difficult to do, but kind of give them relaxing images to ease that anxiety and show them happy things, uh, whatever dog happy things are. So is that, I don't know, it, it starts feeling a little weird to me like I wonder how much I have a dog and I, I wonder if that would 
make me feel like a bad person or if that would <laughs> make me feel better like maybe he's not super lonely while I'm gone but it you start to kind of wonder how much you can or should control um, the lives of other things you know pets are so forgiving you know and they don't seem to resent stuff like like you leave them outside in the in the alberto winter by mistake and then let them back in and they're just ha happy to be in they don't give you the kind of look that a human would what were you thinking you know so so in a, in a way you don't have to be any harder on yourself than the pet themselves would be right like you don't need to feel what was i thinking if the pet isn't saying what were you thinking you know? yeah they're just interested in the overall consequence Yes, Ashita left me out in the cold by mistake, but now I'm back inside and everything's okay. Yeah. So. Okay, but then how would you feel about doing that with, um, let's say, children or let's say um, people who uh, people who have neurodegenerative disorders who are. Right. In in, in a home and yeah. What, I, what I've thought about a lot recently is pigs, you know, because recently we're, we're, we're doing a lot of pig to human transplants for the very first time. And people are talking about, well, so how should we treat the pig? Like with kidney transplants, maybe you would just harvest one kidney from the from the pig, so the pig can go go on living. But wouldn't it be more efficient to take the boat? You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. We, these are areas of kind of human moral standing that we just haven't dealt with. But don't you think that there will be more and more things like that? There are things that are perfectly acceptable to us today that will be shockingly bad in the future. You know, they'll look back, I can't believe they, they did that. And we don't know what those things are even, you know, but but certainly, you know, if, if you think of like dueling, there was really a long period of time and this was a male thing, you know, stupid men. So one man would, would, would offend another man. Right, so you take your glove and you slap the guy with your glove and challenge them to a duel, and yeah, you know, one of you would die, and that was it. It was completely acceptable, right? It was just you know part part of society. So we don't do that anymore. <laughs> and how many other stupid things are we doing today that we think are perfectly normal? That you know, human culture, the future will just think. It was incredibly stupid. Those people in 2022, look at all the, the crazy things that they were doing. Didn't they know better? Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of hard to figure that stuff out. And that's just assuming that we continue to progress in a positive direction and that, uh, you know, human flourishing and fulfillment just increases and increases. Of course, it could go in the other direction where we're back to caveman existence and stuff. But yeah, so that, that, that could change things even further. Uh, Ms. Spa? Um, yeah, just going back to, I guess, like your VR point. So there were kind of like two things about that I was just thinking about. So one of them was like with the animals and pets, like I'm not sure exactly about like the practicality of like actually using them because like, I don't know how the pets would be in the house with the VR set, but then also be able to like navigate around the house without like bumping into things constantly or like being aware of kind of their surroundings. Unless like the cow one, they're kind of kept in their stalls and like they don't really move around a lot, which like that might make sense or work. And then I guess the second point was of just like 
almost making a breed of animals that may become so dependent on VR that they would not be able to like distinguish (laughs) reality and like live without it so like would cows understand the difference between like what is real in their VR versus like when you take it off and they're just like in their environment and are like is this even like real life and then they can't produce milk anymore because they're like so fixated on like their perfect world in the VR system but that's like something else to just think about. Well, I think you you would realize the first part of your question, that's a fixable, fixable problem that you can have a VR headset that the pet is able to decide whether to be able to see through the thing and see their surroundings or watch TV, right? So it, it's very much like watching TV and the pet watches humans watching TV and they have some idea of how it works that it's it's not quite real it, it yeah and so you you could make a system so your dog could wear the thing and the dog could decide at any moment whether they want to actually move around and see where they're going or want to stay stationary and do this kind of playing like I'm a human watching TV, right? Yeah, so that that is certainly possible. Just like smart contact lenses, it seems to me to make a VR headset that you can actually see through and you can turn on and off is, is relatively simple. I think the second part of what you said is also interesting too, like the whole forming a dependency on it. Because um, when I think about, you know, forming a dependency on things like that, I I think I also see it in even even us (laughs) and even like the kids who are, um, I think, growing up with a lot more technology than we did. and I, I only got a phone when I was like an like a iPhone when I was in, in high school, but I still feel like I'm pretty dependent on it. So I, I can only imagine if I had started having access to these kind of technologies to basically having a screen um, whenever I want, watching whatever I want, um, I would also be pretty dependent on that just because it's such a, it it's kind of a crutch, right? Like when you're sad or when you're bored or you you don't have anyone to talk to you just turn on your screen you just start scrolling watching whatever you want so i think that is very i think that is very realistic in terms of if you have cows (laughs) who who love their vr pastures and they're happy there um, and then when you turn it off they're depressed because they realize they're still in that same pen they still are like you know stacked next to like 80 more cows it 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 is very possible that that would actually become a a dependency that they would um have a very difficult time uh living without that the other moral thing about pigs we're going to face is the fact that looking at human children versus pigs that, that there are lots of times when we are uh, dealing with children who are less capable than a pig, you know, and may, it, at that point in their, you know, development, they're thinking less clearly than the pig, you know, in every way, the, the pig is sort of intellectually superior to this child right here. And, you know, it, it used to be pigs were in our lives only because we killed them for meat, but now we're actually transplanting pig organs. And then the other thing that's kind of amusing and scary at the same time is because pigs grow bigger than people, pig organs grow bigger than people's organs. And it's fine with the kidney because, you know, the abdominal cavity is pretty big. You can fit a big thing in there. But with the heart and lungs, it's a big problem because the heart can grow larger than the human rib cage and be sort of thumping against the rib cage. Let me out. The heart is the pig heart is saying. So they're they're gonna we 
we, at the current time, sp most of us spend zero time thinking about pigs and pig welfare and pigs compared to humans, you know, that's just not, not a thing. But I'm pointing out that as, as this pig to human transplant um, enterprise picks up, you know, there are going to be lots of moral questions and some of them will be a little bit amusing. <laughs> what does this mean? You know, and, yeah. So, and of course that, that's just a small uh, sub-segment of the overall question of, you know, if, if we become able to improve our own lives very greatly through technologies of all sorts, what about lower animals? Should we do the same thing for them? You know, do they not have, have the right to also have their lot improvement and, and improved? And of course, it, it goes back to David Pierce's point, which, which is that he thinks it's possible to rule out violent death amongst all living things. I mean, you, you could basically keep all of you know biology going by providing food to the lions so they don't have to kill things and so on. You have, have lion gyms so can, they can stay as fit as they used to when they were chasing things to kill them, but now they're sort of having fun at the gym the way we do. Yeah, so, and that's kind of endless, right? <laughs> that line of thinking doesn't have any easy confines to feel. The, uh, I guess you could stop at, at, at plants because plants don't really, they're, they're not really conscious. They don't need, need to be conscious. <laughs> they're doing just fine without it. But you know, you, you can think about all conscious life and, and, and whether we owe them something once we are able to live in a kind of human utopia should we make an animal utopia, and, and, you know, for what, which animals, yeah. I always find it really challenging uh, when we're, when you're talking about these kind of things, like when we're talking about animals quality of life, I just feel like I'm, I just feel very like emotionally attached to these animals, but I, I feel like it's so difficult because everything that we do is is so contradictory because there are always like for example i was just thinking about how once i started um my my master's in neuroscience although i wasn't in a lab that used rats um i i i knew people who were so i would go to their labs and it was it was so jarring because how we study um you know impacts to the brain what happens to the human uh brain when they've experienced blunt force trauma is that we you know we induce that blunt force trauma on rats like perfectly healthy rats you drop something on them or things like that and then um you can also see them on the table with um parts of their skull removed they're they're still alive but we're looking at their brain activity and it's so difficult to kind of uh you know make it make sense in my mind because we also have uh rats as pets like we we have hamsters who yep. and, right. and they're very intelligent as well so it's really it's it's so difficult because i maybe i'm just very pessimistic but i feel like even if we keep improving our own technology um we'll always have animals as like you know the second class citizens who are yeah. the vehicle to improve our lives with, you know? Right. The other thing that's interesting is senescence, getting old. There are a fair number of animals that really don't get old. They don't have a senescence. And the feature they have is continued growth. They continue to grow and get bigger their, their entire lives. If you think of uh, whales, that's one, species like that whales can can get very very big they yeah and um, 
So that would be another thing that we would have to get used to. Suppose that tr turns out to be true of, of humans. If we remove whatever it is that stops human growth at the end of uh, puberty, you know, or, or like late teens, early 20s, um, if, and if humans keep growing, maybe they wouldn't age. <laughs> it would be a very strange world with these gigantic humans. It would, it would be like the stuff of fairy tales and legends, right? There really would be giants and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> but I mean, these, these things were just kind of speculating, but Within a few decades, I mean, we'll know whether there's tight linkage between senescence and growth, and we'll know why it is that human growth stops when it does, and whether it's possible to keep the growth going without any tumors forming or anything. So you still don't get the uh, Neoplasia, you, you, you just get continued growth. And if that would mean that we could basically live forever, we just get bigger and bigger. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> That's just one of a large number of questions that, <laughs> that arise when we start talking about this, this stuff. It's sort of interesting because a lot of those large animals that that continue to grow and, and don't really senesce also have weirdly low rates of, of neoplasia, which is I think yeah. another another mystery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like uh, elephants, I I think don't don't get a lot of tumors. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to learn from from those large animals. I think. Um, and in a sense, probably, both whales and um, octopus and squid are smarter than we are in some ways. Like, you might, might be interested in my life. <laughs> I had a plan to have pet uh, octopuses or squid. Uh, but I researched it and I realized this would be the end of my career because they're so clever and they develop likes and dislikes among the humans around them. And like when a particular person comes in the room, they can squirt them in the eye. And, all that sort of thing. and, and at night they can get out of their uh, tank as long as there's a hole some somewhere slightly bigger than their eye, which is the only hard part, right? And then they could go to other tanks, eat things and so on, then come back to their own tank in the morning when the human comes back. <laughs> you might say, what happened to all the fish over there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so they, they, they really, in, in, in a sense, are much cleverer than humans and can do a lot of surprising things that would never occur to humans and changing color and matching patterns and colors around them. And um, so th th there are, are lots of, of sort of emotions and experiences in life that other animals have that we have nothing comparable to that. Absolutely nothing. And, and like, Squid and octopus, they, they have a bit of their brain in each tentacle. So even if you cut off the tentacle, it can still do like feeding behavior. <laughs> so, yeah, so that would be a whole different world. So I think, um, what does this mean? It, it, it means that the future is actually even less predictable than we think because there are many more possibilities, you know? We, we, we may think of a certain range of possibilities, but actually the range is much, much bigger and broader than, than we think. 
and all these other surprising considerations. And don't forget the uncontactable populations on the earth, right? Everything we, we think about and we talk about spreading it to everybody else. What about people who've never had civilized human contact, right? There's still groups like that. And what is our moral responsibility to that? Like, should we allow them to stay uncontactable? Uh, uh, they look pretty happy, you know? I mean, the remote pictures of them don't make it look like it's a terrible world at all. Never watching TV, all the things that we spend a lot of time doing, those people spend zero time doing, but they, they don't look unhappy really. Yeah, <clears throat> so that's another side of things to think about. <clears throat> So, you know, there, there was a time, and it, it's kind of interesting to think about, okay, there are 23 medical students taking the course or, or associated with the course. There were two years when we taught the future of medicine to the whole uh, year one medical school class. And it's hard to say why it ended exactly, but I can tell you one of the things that happened that had something to do with, with, with it was Jonathan White, he was just making a joke, but <laughs> you guys will be out of a job, you know, ho, ho. And the medical students got so angry and anyway, so I'm not saying that's directly why the next year we, we didn't teach the whole class, but it has something to do with it, right? But I actually believe the opposite. If you think, well, medicine as a career should end sometime, right? If other jobs are gonna end that job, I mean, maybe it's a thousand years from now, but there shouldn't be a need for any doctors. It's a, but I don't think so, because if you think of all the, the kinds of enhancements people might want that would need medical input and how much um, wish there would be for those things, there would just get more and more, right? So I, I think that kind of means medicine may be the only job that really continues for absolutely ever for the remaining time that that humans are on the earth all these people try to how are we going to do that enhancement is that allowed i don't know what did we decide can we do that yeah what about that one yeah so so that that's how i see it so so it's not that you guys will be out of a job, but you guys will be asked to help with things that you may not think are warranted. You know, somebody wants to be improved in a certain way, and you just feel inside that this is this isn't what you went to medical school for. You know, it's it's like an entirely separate deal. Yeah, so. <clears throat> Okay, so it's 323, and I guess we, we could let you go. Anyway, Ashita, thanks for an excellent teaching session as usual. Uh, and uh, yeah, so Shauna Pandya is teaching the next uh, three sessions. Um, she and I disagree about whether she has any celebrity status, but <laughs> I think she, she does. She, she's kind of everybody's young person's dream of, of packing just a whole lot of life into a short number of years. Um, yeah, so I think you'll find her very exciting as a teacher and she's a good role model. Yeah, and anyway, so, it was kind of intriguing that some of the things that you said you really wanted added to the course, she already does. <laughs> so, <laughs> since we're kind of already there, you know, predicting how we could improve the course. Yeah. 
So that's something to look forward to. So uh, yeah. So anyway, um, I will see you on Thursday and thanks for today. Thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. bye, -bye.